Welcome everybody to the James and Kathleen Stone Initiative. It's our, our initiative on inequality or the dark side of inequality. Today, I'm delighted to um, welcome Rachel, Professor Rachel Sherman, the Michael E. Gellert Professor and Chair of Sociology at the New School. Um, Rachel's work, Professor Sherman's work is this, this fascinating set of books and articles that all uh, around the question of how and why unequal social relations are reproduced. Her first book uh, is called Class Acts, published by University of California Press, and in which she took a job, a series of jobs at a couple of fancy hotels. I think you would say it more formally than fancy hotels, but that's what they were, and saw how the staff analyzed how both workers and guests managed their unequal relations and how workers kind of created a space of dignity and empowerment in the face of this vastly unequal situation. Her next book, Uneasy Street, The Anxieties of Affluence, uh, delved into the lived experience of privilege among wealthy and affluent New Yorkers. Uh, I have to say, if you haven't read this book, it's with as I said, Princeton Press in 2017. It reads like a novel. You, I, you just can't put it down. Partially, uh, for those of you who aren't in the top one-tenth of the 1%, you'll just be astonished at how these people think. Uh, really a, a wonderful book. Today, uh, Professor Sherman is gonna talk about our current book titled Class Traders, the world of wealthy progressives and what it uh, uh, looks like. Uh, I should just add quickly that Professor Sherman has also conducted uh, uh, research on the US labor movement uh, and has a long string of, as I say, books and articles. So we're delighted to welcome you to Brown, Professor Sherman. Before I turn it over to you, let me remind the audience that as soon as you have questions, just type them in. And uh, when we get to the question and answer, I will uh, toss your questions uh, to Professor Sherman. Be, feel free to sign your name to your question, particularly if you think it's a very good one. Uh, Rachel Sherman, welcome to Brown. Okay, after all this time, I still can't unmute myself. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you so much for inviting me and thank you to Margaret Weir for organizing this and to Jim for that very generous introduction and thanks to the audience for being here. Um, I am a graduate and undergraduate of Brown University, so it's nice to be at my alma mater, even if only virtually. Uh, so I'm going to be talking today about my new book project, as Jim said, uh, which is about, as the title of the talk suggests, wealthy people who are advocating radical redistribution of resources and taking action toward changing systems of distribution. So they do this by moving money in a number of unconventional ways, which I'll talk about. But what I'm especially interested in is the way they confront cultural narratives of who deserves what and why. So to call these people class traders is complicated, uh, and we can talk about that choice. But ultimately, the reason I've decided to do this is because these people are pushing against a central condition of existence of their own class, which is accumulation. And part of what I want to focus on is the way their actions challenge a very powerful culture of accumulation among the wealthy. So the duty to accumulate, I'm going to argue, is embedded in their sense of self as a good person, which is also central to institutions of, of money management. So Margaret asked me to not talk for more than 35 minutes, so I'm just going to share as much as I can about that project uh, in that time. I'm not going to be using a PowerPoint, so you can just look at my office, which is cleaner than it has been in four years, thanks to me doing this talk. Um, so let me just start by saying something about my last book, Uneasy Street, as Jim said, and thank you, Jim, for saying such nice things about its readability. Uh, that book was based on 50 interviews with wealthy New York parents, which were focused on lifestyle and spending choices, and especially on kids schooling and home purchase and renovation. And I found in that project that my subjects expressed discomfort with wealth and inequality, and more or less explicitly, and there were important differences among them, but all of them were trying to be morally worthy, good people, and all of them saw this as challenged in some way by stigmas of wealth. They tended to invoke narratives of deservedness based in hard work, as we might imagine, but also disciplined consumption, giving back, and not being entitled. 
this is acting rude or self-important, you know, thinking they deserve it because they're better than other people somehow, and so on. And I argue in the book that ironically, not being entitled in this behavioral and affective sense, right, not feeling or acting in certain ways, actually makes it okay to be materially entitled. Um, and I also argue in that book that judgments of individual rich people as good or bad actually reproduce the system of legitimate inequality. So if some people are bad, other people must be good. For example, Warren Buffett still controls billions of dollars, regardless of you know where he lives and his ranch house in Omaha that he's been living in since the 50s, or how down to earth he is, or how nice he is to the waiter, or whatever. Um, so I advocate thinking about this in terms of the morality of distributions rather than moralities of individuals. So in doing the research for Uneasy Street and in its aftermath, I began to encounter organizations of wealthy people who are working against these narratives of good personhood. Um, and those are the people who've become the subject of this new book. So these rich people don't believe that their own wealth is justified by their being good people in these ways, hardworking, disciplined consumers, giving back, and so on. Instead, they see themselves as having systemic advantages that are morally indefensible. And, you know, they differ, the people I've talked to differ in the amount of wealth they control and in their political priorities, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But they all recognize that class, race, gender, education, and chance have given them and others like them uh, big advantages, which are unrelated to their own effort or their moral character. And they know that these advantages have been produced and reproduced in the United States by longstanding racist, anti-labor, and anti-immigrant policies and practices. Many people also see the creation of wealth as extractive, exploitative, bad for the planet and bad for people, including themselves. Now, obviously, there are lots of non-wealthy people who share these beliefs, and many of them and many of the people I'm talking about don't think rich, mostly white people should be centered in social change. But I think exploring what these people do is important for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, regardless of how they might feel about it, the fact remains that wealthy people's disproportionate power means that their actions matter disproportionately. They exert extraordinary influence, as you all know, over philanthropy, investment, politics, culture. Uh, their preferences affect whether and how public goods like healthcare and education are provided, what democratic participation looks like, how markets function, how workers are treated, and even as uh, Megan Ming Francis talked about recently in this seminar, how social justice movements develop. So rich people's beliefs about merit and distribution carry outsized importance in our political landscape. And while class traders are obviously a very small minority of the wealthy population, they're closely linked to broader wealthy communities and to wealthy institutions. And they're questioning these conventional discourses in those spaces as well as in broader publics. Second, looking at these actors and their organizations activates new questions in the study of social movements. Whether class traders in themselves constitute a social movement is an open question, we could talk about it, but they certainly participate actively in grassroots movements of all kinds. Yet these people are unusual among social movement actors because they are beneficiaries of unjust systems, right? So they're organizing against the social arrangements um, that produce resources of various kinds for them and are conventionally understood to benefit them. This is also true, for example, of white anti-racists working to change systems of white supremacy. And not surprisingly, there's a lot of overlap. You know, many of those I've called class traders would also identify as anti-racist. So these people are facing the question of how to use their power to give up that same power. They're also pushing against what's widely understood to be their self-interest and questioning powerful cultural discourses that say they deserve what they have. But rather than being motivated by noblesse oblige or altruism, effective altruism or otherwise, um, or a fear of like pitchforks, you know, the pitchforks are coming for us, they actually believe that increase in equality isn't healthy for them either. So looking at their efforts through a social movement frame foregrounds these hegemonic, uh, sorry, counter hegemonic constructions of self-interest, as well as those of merit and worth, and illuminates the relationship of affect culture and identity to social action around redistribution. This perspective also enables analysis of cross-class and cross-racial movement communities and the prospects for and problems with uh, nurturing solidarity across difference. Now, before I move on, I want to address the possibility that you may be feeling a little bit skeptical about this. I can't see any of you. Um, 
but <laughs> I know from experience that people often are like a little bit wary of, of the, the, these class traders. So I often get questions like, Aren't these supposed class traders just virtue signaling? Aren't they just keeping their privilege while getting status from criticizing it? Aren't they simply reproducing the system through philanthropy? And if they care so much, why don't they just give it all away? So I, I think some of what I'm going to say is going to speak to those issues. But I would first just want to kind of encourage you to be aware of that skepticism and bring it into the light if you're feeling it. And I'd actually like to do a tiny experiment. Um, of just asking anyone in the audience to answer a couple of questions just for yourself. Although if you wanna put this in the Q and A, you're certainly welcome to. One question is, are you rich? And why or why not? What does it mean to be rich? Is it about a dollar figure in terms of assets? Is it 1 million? Is it 10 million? Is it 100 million? Um, a quick internet search, which may or may not be entirely accurate that I did today suggests that the bottom, the cutoff for the top 1% in terms of assets is $11 million. Uh, that the cutoff at the top 2% is 2.5 million, and that the cutoff for the top 10% is about 1 million. So regardless of how you answer that question, whether or not you're rich, if you were rich um, and you wanted to contribute to changing social systems of distribution, how would you do that? How much of your money would you give away? Um, who would you give it to? What other kinds of actions might you take? So just want you to think about that, maybe like write it down if you are able to do so. Um, and again, you can share it later in the Q&A if you want. So what I'm hoping to, um, sorry, not lose my screen here. What I'm hoping to show in these relatively brief remarks is that making social change from the top, just like from the bottom or from the middle, isn't an obvious or easy process. So there are real issues about what that even means and what the strategies for achieving change should be. And when it comes to rich people, as I said, I'm especially interested in how a culture of accumulation that makes it hard to imagine being a successful and secure person without continuing to accumulate kind of structures uh, the actions that these class traders are going to take. So let me say something about this sort of history of this. Um, obviously, there have been progressive wealthy people throughout history. Many revolutionaries have come from the upper middle or upper classes, our friend Friedrich Engels, for example. Um, but the field that I'm talking about, as I conceptualize it, was established by white inheritors in the 1970s, mostly from old money families who were involved in social movements in the 1960s, including the New Left, the Civil Rights Movement, and the women's and gay liberation movements. Their politics and political activism led them to start and support local social justice funds, um, which were innovative in that they had community activists choose where the donations went. So the so rich people were giving up some measure of control um, and they tended to go to you know, grassroots movement type stuff. Uh, one of the first of these was the Haymarket People's Fund in Boston, which some of you may be familiar with in 1974. And ultimately I think there were about 15 of these local um, funds, most of which still exist. And so this is the beginning of social justice philanthropy, which is a big piece of this work, and I'll say more about that in one second. Uh, most of these local community funds still exist, and many of them remain on the forefront of uh, social justice philanthropy today. So I won't go through like the whole history of the field since then, but let, let me just say that since um, that period of the 70s and early 80s, when a lot of these smaller organizations were founded, there, were, there have been all kinds of organizations in this field primarily philanthropic organizations like foundations of various kinds that were oriented toward wealthy progressives. Um, in the late 1990s, people in this community founded Resource Generation, which is an organization for people under 35 with wealth that's become central to my project. It's not exactly a philanthropic organization, uh, but it does political education and what we might call consciousness raising, although that's also a complicated term as well as creating connections among young wealthy people to talk to each other, um, most of whom are inheritors, and between young wealthy people and uh, social movements like the Movement for Black Lives and many other uh, grassroots movements. So they use conferences, local chapters, there's maybe 16 or so local chapters, and what they call praxis groups to talk about racial capitalism, patriarchy, colonialism, um, and to talk about what they can do with their money uh, and their experience of having money, as I said. So many of these younger people have experience in other social movements, particularly racial justice and queer organizing. And this is one of the things that helps them move into class 
based activism, just as it helped to people who could be their parents or grandparents and very occasionally are like sometimes I interview people who, um, you know, like a mother daughter pair, one of whom was involved in Haymarket, for example, and other the daughter is involved in resource generation. Um, and resource generation has grown enormously in recent years, I think probably doubling its membership from 500 or so to over 1000 just in, in the last couple of years. They've increased the number of local chapters a lot. They've started more actively organizing on college campuses. And in fact, I think as of about a year ago, there is a chapter of resource generation at Brown. And this growth was invigorated by Occupy Wall Street, the rise for, of the movement for Black Lives and general uh, racial justice movements and the Trump presidency. And the field in general has grown for the same reasons. So in the last decade or so, a number of other organizations for wealthy people who are making progressive change have emerged, including the Solidaire Network, which is a progressive donor network founded partly by a resource generation alumni. Uh, the Patriotic Millionaires is another organization which focuses primarily on policy, particularly on raising taxes on the wealthy. There are an increasing number of alternative investment firms, and I'll say a little bit about alternative investment also, um, and other kinds of even you know family foundations or small private foundations that are kind of getting into this more social justice oriented philanthropy. There's also been an increasing amount of press on these organizations just in the last couple of years in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Guardian, the New Yorker, even Town and Country and Harper's Bazaar. Um, a couple of weeks ago, there was an article about resource generation and associated young people and redistributors in um, El Pais, which is a major Spanish newspaper. But there hasn't been much research on this work, right? So that's the, the, the gap that I'm trying to fill. So in terms of the methods that I've used, I've interviewed about 100 people for this project. Um, about 75 of them are people who identify as wealthy and, and working for systemic redistribution. And the rest of the people you know, work with those people in nonprofits and various kinds of advising or organizing relationships. And I reached the wealthy respondents, which is mainly who I'm gonna talk about, through the organizations in which they participate, as well as through snowball sampling. But regardless of how I came to talk with them, most of them do or have participated in organizations for wealthy people, including Resource Generation, Solidaire, the Threshold Foundation, uh, Responsible Wealth, which is another tax, tax the rich organization, uh, Patriotic Millionaires, the Women Donor Network, there's a, a bunch of them. And these organizations, although I'm not going to have time to really talk about it, but participating in organizations has had really profound effects on both their political analyses and sort of interpretations of politics and on the way they actually use their money. Uh, the sample of wealthy people that I've spoken to ranges from 19 to 81. I'm sorry, their age ranges from 19 to 81, but about half of them are between 25 and 40. Most of those people associated with resource generation. Sample includes some of the original actors in this field who are now in their 60s and 70s. Um, and across the board, they're mainly white, although a dozen or so, mainly of the younger people, are of South or East Asian or Middle Eastern origin. Um, typically children of immigrants, but not always. And there's a very wide range of wealth and that this is actually related in an interesting way to the question of who counts as rich. And we can talk about that if people are interested, but the median of, uh, of the sample in terms of individual or family wealth is around $20 million. The majority of people that I've spoken to have inherited wealth, but some of them have accumulated it usually through tech um, or they have the skills to do so if they're younger and some of these people are in college or have just very recently graduated from college. And some of them for, you know, there's a, some of the inheritors are inheriting from their parents. They're not all of these people are kind of old money. Most of them probably are not old money. And you actually see a transition to kind of finance, tech, real estate, um, capital, in the parents of many of these redistrib younger re redistributors rather than the kind of old money, um, you know, quasi aristocracy kind of thing. I've also done participant observation in a number of organizational spaces, particularly in person and virtual conferences and a wide variety of webinars. I'm happy to talk about that more. 
So I want to talk a little bit about the actions that they take and the philosophies behind those actions. And as I said, it can be tempting to think that these people should just give it all away. Like, if you care so much, why don't you just give it all away? Many of them do think about that. Um, and some of them do give very significant, uh, unconventionally significant proportions of their assets. But as I said, it's not always easy for any of us to know exactly how to make systemic change. And the idea of giving it all away without ever specifying where to give is not super helpful, I think, in terms of uh, imagining change. So there are differences among my respondents in terms of how people understand their ultimate goals and the strategies to, in order to achieve those goals. They're all critical of narratives of meritocracy. They're all critical of traditional philanthropy. And I'll say more about both of those. Some people in this field, and this is the minority of people I've spoken to, but mainly the older people who have accumulated wealth themselves, believe in capitalism, but they wanna see the state play a bigger role in redistribution and the creation of opportunity. At the other extreme is the, is a, or I'm, I'm going to say people, but people, you know, of course, there's a lot of, or there can be a lot of overlap in, in these opinions. The other extreme are people who are profoundly opposed to racial capitalism and see wealth creation, as I said, as destructive for people and the planet. So that's a much more kind of radical political stance. For people in the former category, the goal is a more active welfare state, and their main concern is pushing at the electoral and policy level for higher taxes on the wealthy, as well as higher wages for workers and more democratic access. More radical people tend to have a more bottom-up focus on supporting grassroots movements and self-determination of marginalized people. Not surprisingly, these people are often, although definitely not exclusively, younger and skeptical of the state, I think partly because they haven't ever seen the state as a redistributive actor, right? Unlike older people who often benefited from free college education when public universities were free and you know really good and um, state investments in infrastructure and so on. Also, these more radical younger people often participating in racial justice movements are very critical of mass incarceration and state violence, especially toward people of color. So they have a very negative association with some aspects of the state. Okay, so that all said, um, how do class traders use their money and other resources to make systemic change? As you'd expect, those who are focused on policy take fairly conventional electoral action in terms of supporting progressive Democrats and specifically trying to amplify redistributive tax policy. Those who are more focused on movements um, work to move money first toward social justice philanthropy. And I want to be clear that this is neither the traditional upper class philanthropy that goes toward like museums and the opera and the symphony or everybody's alma mater. Um, nor is it the reproductive philanthro capitalism of Bill Gates and others like him. So these people understand that conventional philanthropy is undemocratic um, and particularly philanthro capitalism where you know, super rich people take over the functions of the state um, and that it reproduces and legitimates systems that actually perpetuate inequality. Um, so instead, people who are active in social justice philanthropy advocate for funding grassroots social justice organizing in groups led by those most affected um, and for giving up control to those organizations. So these are people who give to organizations associated, again, with the movement for Black Lives, Indigenous sovereignty, land re redistribution, uh, climate and gender justice, and so on. They believe that donors should have less control over movements, so they support reducing the bureaucratic hoops that recipient organizations have to jump through, including elaborate processes of evaluation and measurement, and generally they try to reduce donor control. Um, people in the social justice philanthropy, philanthropy field often give away unconventionally large amounts and, um, and large proportions of their assets, as I said before. A lot of class traders also are pursuing social justice investing or alternative investing. And this goes beyond a kind of you know, conventional socially responsible investment, which is very common now, this uh, kind of screening, broad screens that are used to shape investment decisions. These people, in fact, redirect investment capital out of Wall Street entirely um, to solidarity economy enterprises like community loan funds, cooperatives, other kinds of non-extractive efforts. And now, as I said before, alternative investment firms are starting to crop up in order to advise investors on how to do this. What's notable 
is not only the emphasis on using capital in a generative rather than an extractive way, um, but also a willingness to receive low or sometimes even zero returns on these investments. So there's a way in which you know, this kind of action challenges the border between investment and philanthropy. Beyond moving their money in these ways, uh, the class traders use other resources, particularly their own networks, which tend to be quite elite, uh, to push for change in philanthropy, in investment, and in other areas like legacy admissions in colleges. Um, and you know, almost all of the people that I spoke to, particularly everybody under 50, went to some kind of elite college. Um, and finally, and again, to me, this is the most important piece, class traders are challenging common sense narratives and practices about money and merit. Many of them are publicly challenging justifications of meritocracy, right? This is one thing I think the patriotic millionaires do uh, that's really important beyond the policy work is that its members speak publicly about how they've been able to accumulate their millions because of the systemic advantages they've had. Um, they also tend to push back against the idea that rich people are job creators. So they'll make like videos that will circulate, you know, on social media um, that say I'm a millionaire and I, you know, I don't really deserve it or whatever. Maybe, maybe not exactly that, but things to that effect. Um, other activists working with other organizations or independently um, will talk publicly about their class advantages. So they're challenging this narratives of hard work and disciplined consumption as the foundation of good personhood and deservedness, as in some of these media profiles that I mentioned earlier. So if you go look at the, the articles that I was talking about, you'll see the ways that they're explicitly challenging that. Um, class traders also break the general social taboo on talking about money in other ways. They talk with other people in class homogenous spaces, as in resource generation and elsewhere, about their experiences of having wealth and their conflicts about it. They initiate conflicts, uh, sorry, conversations about privilege in their families, and they push family members to move money differently. Some of them even question the morally inflected language that we use to talk about money and merit, uh, saying accumulated instead of earned, because earned has such a deep moral valence. Um, and high net wealth instead of high net worth. And they also challenge, and I alluded to this before, the idea of economic accumulation as a manifestation of self-interest. They see themselves as being better off in a world with less inequality. They talk about the isolation that being wealthy often brings, and they reframe security as coming from community rather than from hoarding resources. So that's what they try to do, but there's a lot of obstacles to taking this kind of action. This is the last piece I wanna talk about, um, the ways in which I think these folks are, are swimming upstream culturally. And this is also where I'm finally gonna share a little bit of my data. So one issue, although I won't talk about this very much, I'm happy to come back to it, is class traders themselves coming to terms with negative emotions around having wealth. This is especially true for inheritors who often feel guilt and shame for um, having you know, access to, to a lot of resources. These are emotions that contribute to people not wanting to talk about their wealth or not feeling comfortable talking about it and sometimes not even wanting to think about it. But what ultimately happens when people start working through these feelings, which again is what they're doing in, in some of these organizational spaces, is that they come to believe that their position in a system of distribution does not indicate a moral failure on their part. So again, this is similar to white anti-racists who recognize that they benefit from white supremacy, even if they're not individually racist, they don't hold individually bigoted beliefs, but who also aren't paralyzed by feeling terrible about that, right? So we see often this, um, I think in general discourse, this link between you know, this de a defensiveness about um, benefiting from white supremacy as if like I'm being called a racist and, and I'll come back to that in a second. So the individuals doing this class trader work have to kind of get past the, the class version of that and often the race version of that too. Then the moral imperative becomes to work against the system in the ways I've described by moving money and by uh, taking more public stands. And of course, we know this is important also in thinking about poor people, right, whose position in the income and wealth distribution is often thought to be a function of their individual moral character. Um, so the relationship between moral character and position in distributions, you know, is, is very fraught both at the bottom and the top. 
Another thing that I won't talk about at all is the question of how much is enough to keep or to give away, um, which as you can imagine is very complicated to think about. But I wanna focus on what I'm calling this culture of accumulation, right? Which is the way that accumulation becomes the foundation of good personhood in wealthy communities. To be a good person, especially a man, means making or saving, making or saving money. To be a good consumer, especially a woman, means being disciplined in what you buy. Being a good parent means ensuring that your children are secure um, and that they're good, not entitled, you know, non-obnoxious people. Um, and being a good inheritor means stewarding and ideally increasing wealth for future generations. So I want to tell you about Kenneth was a 40-year-old inheritor of wealth who articulated a fairly conventional notion of wealthy good personhood. I would not call him a class traitor, um, but so he's sort of a good foil for, for those who are. When I interviewed him in late 2019, his assets had recently reached, as he put it, nine figures, which then I had to like count, that is $100 million. Um, his family's fortune came originally from natural resource extraction, but it got much bigger in the 1980s thanks to investments in the stock market and has continued to grow. So he told me he felt a bit regretful that he didn't have a high paying job in finance that would allow him to contribute to the quote family nut, but he was not interested in that kind of work. He thought he compensated for it by keeping his consumption down saying quote, I don't spend profligately, you know, I live well within my means, which are substantial, but I'm saving money every year. So he's articulating this logic of working for money and consuming prudently as the elements of good personhood, uh, both of which, again, are essentially about increasing accumulation, even when there is no necessity to accumulate. Now, Kenneth's income from investments that year was $10 million, of which he had given away 10%, $1 million. Um, he's extremely concerned about climate change. He's very aware of all kinds of pressing social issues, but he resisted the idea of giving away more and especially giving away principal. He thought he couldn't guarantee the money would really have an important effect. Quote, if I could put $30 million into something and I knew it would end up with a technology that recycled plastic better, I would go and do that, he said. But because he couldn't be sure, he thought his more important job was to steward the wealth for future generations of the family. He said, quote, I guess if it were easy to find that sort of stuff, meaning that kind of philanthropic enterprise, uh, I would be more willing to part with my great, great grandchildren's money. It's like, how can I ensure that giving it and not keeping it is going to have the same ROI, meaning return on investment? So Kenneth was describing the dominant common sense about both philanthropy and investment, right? On the one hand, charitable giving should have a measurable and significant impact, which he articulates in the language of profit, right? Return on investment, um, and which the giver can be confident about in advance. On the other hand, he's saying that the job of wealthy people is to accumulate for future generations, never giving or investing in ways that interfere with maximizing growth. And this is also, again, the reigning common sense about good personhood. Rich people who control and accumulate their money wisely are morally worthy. But class traders are pushing a different view of power, control, and profit, right? They're saying that they should have less of each of those things. Julia was a 30-year-old white artist and active resource generation member with an Ivy League education who was to inherit at least $50 million of the $150 million plus that her father had accumulated. She articulated a philosophy of, quote, investment, very different from Kenneth's, suggesting that, quote, giving away money is investing in the world we want to live in. What's that money going to do if we have a climate crisis and we're like living in a post-apocalyptic world? Nothing. But what could it do now to stop that from happening or stop people from dying? Um, so that's the, you know, it's kind of alternative common sense about it. In refusing power and profit, Julia and others are also destabilizing the idea that accumulating is the mark of a good person. And this leads to strong resistance from their families. Now, it's hard to talk about money in families to begin with. It's seen as déclassé. Children are told, um, often growing up, that they will be at risk of, you know, having people just be their friend because they have money or having people just be, like, romantically interested in them because they're rich. So they're never supposed to talk about it. And love and money are intertwined in very complicated ways in these families too, uh, perhaps in every family. Um, but parents also maintain silence about money because they wanted to make sure that their children would turn out to be good people, worthy of their wealth and class advantages rather than spoiled and entitled. 
So many adult children of, of wealthy parents who I've interviewed say that these imperatives led their parents never to talk to them about money and for them to have no idea how much money they had, the family had or that they would inherit. Carolyn, a 28-year-old woman who has one Asian and one white parent, said her parents wouldn't tell her how much money they have because, quote, they don't want us to think that we're rich and they don't want us to be, in their words, lazy trust fund kids or think that they want us to feel that we have to work for it or earn it and it's not just like given to us. So part of the job of parents is to cultivate their kids' work ethic, which means not telling them about their money. And then often suddenly they find out about it in these crazy ways and, you know, they're completely unprepared for it. Um, another example of this is uh, someone I interviewed named Paul, who was a 30-year-old who had inherited about $3.5 million from his mother's side of the family. He was living on that money in order to pursue his passion of political work, although he was also giving away a fair amount of money. He had recently argued with his father, who had said, quote, I feel like if you didn't have this inheritance, you would be homeless. And part of this fear, in Paul's view, was his father's, quote, internalizing being a good father means that my children have earned income and that kind of stuff. So then I got him to see, like, don't do that. That's on you. That's that's not on you. That's on me. I think he gets it now. Oh, Paul's fine. Like, it turns out he can be a millionaire from inheritance and not a failure. Another aspect of being a good parent is ensuring your children's security by continuing to accumulate. So both inheritor and accumulator parents often want to keep controlling money because they're afraid that their kids are too young to make major decisions about it and that they'll take untenable risks. And there's a lot of stories of parents like offering their kids money to buy really expensive like homes or cars or vacations, but refusing to let them give the equivalent amount of money away. Um, Ray, a 30-year-old white inheritor who uses they pronouns, told me they had asked their mother to stop being a co-signer on their trust of nearly a million dollars. Ray told me, my argumentation is, I'm almost 30. I should be able to do this. And she was like, you're only 30. You're going to fuck it all up. And this is in spite of the fact that Ray's stepfather was a billionaire, billion with a B, and the mom herself had her own money. So the, the idea that this person would be at any risk, you know, is not realistic. Um, and older class traders who I talked to who were not planning to leave money to their children describe this as the hardest thing for their peers to understand, even though, of course, inherited wealth is, you know, directly opposed to values of meritocracy. So there's, I'm thinking of one couple who had a net, we a net wealth of about $70 million, but were only giving each of their kids some of the equivalent of a down payment on a house. And the older their kids got, and the more you know, the parents had already given them the down payment on the house, they were just not going to leave them anything. And they said, you know, our friends, even though they're sympathetic to us politically, they can't understand why we would do that, do this. Um, Constance, a woman in her late 40s who came from a multi-generational billionaire family told me, it's like, we're stewards of this wealth. We can't give it away because the grandparents made it and the grand grandkids need it. And so God forbid you would fuck it up and give it away or invest it weirdly. So you end up so conservative because you don't feel a sense of ownership and agency. Um, okay, I'm just going to finish in a couple minutes. But uh, adult children of wealth accumulators described their parents as defensive when confronted with their own structural advantages and critiques of the system because accumulators think of themselves as having worked hard and therefore deserving what they have. Uh, for men especially, as I said, to be a successful person is to accumulate. Constance, the billionaire family woman I just quoted, um, told me that even though her father shared her concern for social justice, equity, and the environment, quote, my dad still feels like the making of money is a symbol of correct and successful action. It is the prize for goodness. Uh, an RG activist, a resource generation activist in her 30s, told me that her father was, quote, very attached to wanting to feel like a good person. So her parents got upset with her for making him feel bad about his job in finance, which was actually connected to a host of problematic political issues. Now, accumulation is not only valued in families and among some of these peers, but also logistically anchored in institutions of financial management. Um, these include institutions of wealth preservation, accounting, and philanthropy. So, of course, the purpose of trusts and other financial vehicles is to ensure that accumulation persists, right? Sometimes in perpetuity, sometimes completely without any consultation with uh, the recipients themselves or the children of the recipients. 
of the goal of financial professionals is to accumulate wealth for their clients, right? Or protect their clients' wealth. And that's what makes them feel like successful people, as well as often providing the basis of their own compensation, right? Conventional wisdom about philanthropy says giving back is good, yes, but only in as much as it doesn't interfere with principle and as long as it's tax deductible. So all these people who are trying to redistribute, you know, even people who are well into adulthood, um, into their like 60s, often face resistance from financial managers and confront legal arrangements they can't even understand, right, let alone actually uh, change. Fiona, a progressive financial advisor and self-identified wealthy person, told me, I've never seen a traditional financial advisor be like, save less, give more to your community. Uh, Warren, a white man in his late 50s who controlled over $20 million from a family business, told me, right, you go to your investment advisor and say, oh, I want to put money in this fund for, you know, Black farmers in the South. And they look at you like you're insane. You know what? You want a 4% return on your money with high risk? Are you crazy? So there are a lot of obstacles, right, institutional and relational to moving money in these different ways. And in showing this, you know, I'm not trying to justify rich people's hoarding. I'm suggesting that it's politically important to understand how individual feelings of self-worth are connected to money and how cultural ideas about money and selfhood um, are embedded in legal and financial institutions, as well as family and community relationships. So I think I'll stop there. Um, but you know, I just want to emphasize, I don't think this is about rich, individual, greedy people are hoarders. Of course, there are some rich people who are awful and, you know, who are all of those things. But that I think we understand this as being about ideals of good personhood that arrest on accumulation and ideas about scarcity. Like, it's actually impossible to think of yourself as a good person unless you imagine that you're facing scarcity. Um, that that's a generative way for us to kind of approach uh, mobilizing wealthy people for social change. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Rachel. As, as, as with all your work, fascinating. We've got a bunch of questions. Let me remind people that they can just type the question into the Q&A. But let's start with just basic methods. Uh, how long did you talk to these people? How do you find them? And most interestingly, how do they respond when you approach them? What percentage say, go away, sociologists? And do you find that most people are eager to talk, uh, not eager to talk? Uh, and I should probably give you a moment to catch your breath uh, before we jump right into the Q&A, because we've, we've got a line of them. So after you've had a deep breath, tell us a little bit about how the process of learning uh, uh, takes place. And I'm particularly interested in this issue of how they respond when you first approach them. Yeah, thank you. That's a, I mean, that's a great question. I, so I started this research by approaching resource generation. I had had some contact with them because of my previous book, as I said, and um, I, the whole project was supposed to be one part of a larger project about kind of alternative ideas about entitlement, but this, it then took up this whole, that's taken up this kind of book length space. But um, through resource generation, I went to one of their conference, several day conferences, and I just was able to sort of talk to people there. I mean, my access to that space did depend on me identifying as a class privileged person, which I am, and a person who shares their politics, which I do. So you know, I don't think that it, there's something very specific about my own class position and my own background that, you know, um, which I can talk about more. But so I had to kind of show up in that way. And then I made a lot of contacts with those people. And then, you know, I made contacts with some of these other organizations and they put me in touch with their people. And I mean, I think that the, you know, it's it's actually was such a relief to do this research after doing the research for Uneasy Street, because in Uneasy Street, you know, people were really reluctant to talk about money. It was really hard to figure out how to recruit people for that project. Here, you know, all they want to do is talk about it because their politics have to do with talking about it, right? So these are people who are organizationally, they're not necessarily like front and center in these organizations, but they're organizationally committed and they're committed to doing this work. Like I even had, you know, I remember interviewing uh, one young person who said, you know, agreeing to do this interview with you, meaning me, is part of my political work. Like it's me challenging myself. Um, so I think that there were people who thought about it like that. A lot of people I talked to didn't really care about uh, confidentiality. I mean, some of them do because 
their, you know, it's not their money and their parents and whatever, but especially older people and uh, people who are controlling their own money, often they wanted to talk more publicly about it. And that was a huge change from in Uneasy Street. You know, many of the people that I spoke to were just uh, very terrified about, reveal, you know, that their identity would be revealed or that they would be identifiable. So yeah, I have to say, I've really, I've really enjoyed doing this research for that reason. And um, if you don't mind, would you tell us, uh, is it easier to approach because of your background and without too much detail, tell us a little bit about your background. Uh, yeah, well, so I come from a mixed class family. Uh, my mom's family was, didn't, had no money and my father's family had some wealth, not an astronomical amount of wealth by any means, but I inherited some money when I turned 21 and when my grandmother died and I didn't grow up, you know, I grew up in the eighties when before there was so, so much insanity around how people grew up. I think like, I, I think most people would think of the, my lifestyle as upper middle class at the most. Um, but when I had, had inherited wealth myself, I just had sort of freaked out, you know, like many of these young people do now. And so um, I had that understanding and I also have, connections with progressive wealthy people who are in my family. And, you know, so some of this I had been exposed to a little bit before, but again, not, you know, I mean, this is, it's a complicated thing to talk about. It's certainly not astronomical wealth, but, you know, top 10% wealth, let's say that. Well, that really raises a question that you ask the audience, and I wonder not what your answer would be, but what most of the people you interviewed would be, what is rich? So are they all over the map or do they have a mental set of people who are like them? Yeah, it's a fascinating question. I mean, there's a there's an issue of what is rich and what is too rich, right? And I, you know, those things are obviously connected, but I think, you know, some of these, the sort of older patriotic millionaires types of people who are mostly, you know, men, white men, who many of whom have, have accumulated their own money. And as I said, are more likely to believe in kind of like a welfare state capitalism. You know, those people think they have $10 million or $20 million and they're like, yeah, that's great. You know, I just don't think anybody should have $100 million, right? I don't think, I think billionaires are bad. So there's that kind of stance, like that's too much, but I'm not real. you know, maybe some of them would say like, yes, I myself should pay higher taxes on my $10 million, but um, the, the real thing is like the billionaires more. Mm -hmm. Then you have at the other extreme, you know, these young people who are see themselves as class privileged, partly because they, you know, came from affluent families, upper middle class families, they went to private school, they, you know, maybe went to elite universities, they don't necessarily, um, many of them don't control any wealth at, you know, when they're 22 years old or whatever. But um, some of them think that like $100,000 is a lot, right? That's not, I would not say that's the majority of, certainly not the majority of people I interviewed. And I don't even think the majority of people who are in resource generation, but, um, and I think that that's, you know, people sometimes react to, to that fact by saying like, well, they're not that rich, right? Like it doesn't matter, they don't really matter that much because they're not like the 0.1%, they're not controlling everything. And that's certainly true. But I think for purposes of narrative, it really does matter for people who have access to $100,000, you know, or $500,000 or a million dollars to say like, I am wealthy and I, this is a lot, right? Because all of that, how we define those things, um, is relative, you know? And so we have to be really careful about what, what it's relative to. And also for many of these people who are active in movements, you know, they are very close relationships with people who have nothing, right? And that's unusual among wealthy people. So, and it, they just think like, what, you know, $100,000 is like a really a lot more than nothing. So that's, <laughs> a, you know. Um, so yeah, there's a, there is a wide range and, and, but I think Pushing, you know, one of the things that I have found that I found in Uneasy Street, and one of the things that I find honestly presenting this research in front of academic audiences also, is that the um, that people don't want to identify as rich. So we often end up having these conversations about the 0.1% rather than, you know, the top 10% or the top 5% or the top 2% or, you know, however we want to think about it. And I think it is important to kind of open that up a little bit. I, I remember in Uneasy Street, the point that people who look up are constantly feeling like I don't have anything. And the people who look around or down at people making less 
think I'm overprivileged. So it's really has to do with frame frame of reference. And I mean, one thing I would say about those people who look upward in on Easy Street is that they they are um it's not that they want more. I mean, some some of them do, but I think they like it that there are people above them because then it allows them to feel like they're not rich, mm -hmm. right? They don't, they want to be in the middle, even they want to keep their, you know, $2 million a year income or whatever, but they, they also want to feel like they're not rich. Uh, a question from Margaret Weir, my co-director of this project who says hello, and Hi. then asks with the rising importance and attention to climate change, could you envision the class and racial justice issues being overshadowed by work on climate change? I don't think that overshadowed is the word. I think that there, I think that the people, you know, who are working on climate in this community that with the, you know, at least people with more radical politics who tend to be the bulk of people that I'm working with see climate and uh, class and racial justice as intimately intertwined. Right. So they they see climate as a racial justice issue and, you know, certainly as a class issue. And they see I mean, they don't want to be, you know, take the class. Um, escape route, you know, that like rich people, you know, like buy a hilltop in New Zealand or whatever. Right. They they think that that's insane because they see themselves as sharing humanity with with other people. So I think a lot of the climate. Um, conversations are, uh, you know, it, it's all related, I guess. I, I might not be able to articulate it better than that, but I don't think that they don't see those things as mutually exclusive. And our colleague Alex Gurevich uh, asks, what do the people you talk to have to say about unions and more specifically about labor rights? Yeah, I think everybody's in favor of unions and labor rights. I mean, it's interesting to me I mean, certainly like the patriotic millionaires and responsible wealth, the more policy oriented people are, I think, totally in favor of workers' rights. I mean, the, so they're seeing redistribution from the top in terms of taxes, but also, you know, that maybe we wouldn't have so much inequality if people had reasonable wages. So that's, I don't think that's controversial. It's been kind of interesting to me as a labor scholar myself and someone, you know, politically committed to labor. When I first started doing this research, which was in just, Oh God, four years ago in fall of 2018, I was kind of surprised by how little conversation there was about labor because there was so much conversation about race. And because um, that, I mean, obviously those conversations are should be overlapping, but they, they sort of weren't. But now there's a lot more conversation about labor movements and, you know, partly because of Starbucks and Amazon and these other um, labor has a more prominent, I don't know, you know, it's, it's getting more play because it's a little bit more active and it's being articulated, I think, with more of a racial justice frame. So certainly in principle, like everybody's in favor of, of unions and labor rights. But I, I think I think this is a little bit of a problem in some parts of the left anyway, is that people associate unions, you know, with like racist white men who are, you know, doing building trades or something like that. And so there, we don't have enough of an image of a, of a multiracial working class that should be being organized, but maybe that's just me, but I see that a little bit in these spaces. No, I don't think that's just you. Um, Nick, before I get to the next question, are there other ways over the four years you've been uh, looking that the conversation has changed? Does that strike you? Which conversation? Uh, the conversation about um, the focus that uh, the wealthy re uh, rebels have just introducing the notion of change over time with regards to labor uh, and race. Yeah. I wonder if there's other ways the conversations you've had with your interviewees have um, evolved given the times. Yeah, I mean, sometimes, you know, there is a little bit of a sampling issue there in the sense that it's not I see change, whether there's actually been change or just something about me changed, you know, it's hard to know. But I think there's been some change in the vision of electoral politics. So again, when I first started, I, I was a little bit like, everybody was like, you know, we're, we have to bring control back to those most affected and follow the lead of those most marginalized and so on, which, you know, mostly I agree with. But I think there was a thing of like, yeah, the, 
everybody's yes, the rich should pay more taxes. And of course, you know, democracy is important and so on. But it wasn't as like fun to think about as like funding, you know, black farmers in the South or whatever. Now there's been much more bringing that together. So I don't know if people in this audience are familiar for with the group um, Movement Voter Project, which was founded by Billy Wimsat, who is himself an alum of resource generation. And it's a it's a great it's a, I mean, I'm not going to do publicity for this organization, but it, it does electoral mobilization through grassroots organizations nationally. And so that's, you know, it sort of bridges these thing about like, yes, we should be funding grassroots organizing and not just funding individual political candidates or canvassing or whatever. Um, we should be building capacity among movement organizations as they take on electoral projects. Now that may be, you know, because I'm only studying the class traders themselves and not so much, not directly the movements that they're working with, it's hard for me to know what originates in movements and what originates among class traders. You know, I think a lot of it originates in movements. So as much as, you know, the movement for black lives has like a policy platform, right? Which, um, and the, you know, the Breathe Act and the stuff that they were advocating, that's something that then the class trader people are kind of gonna get behind. So that's something that I see as, as a little bit of a shift. Uh, is a question that follows directly on that. And it may be a very subversive question. Brian Bartholomew asks, can non-rich people go to a resource generation meeting or do they check your ID at the door? Well, it depends on what you mean by a meeting. Um, <laughs> you know, resource generation, and you should look, people, anyone interested should look at the website that they have a, you know, an interesting website. The, um, they, their constituents are, I don't know how they would say this actually. So I'm not speaking for them, but their constituents are young people with access to wealth, but they have a cross-class and a cross-race staff. Um, and they certainly make common cause, you know. So I think they have lots of things that, you know, anybody's welcome at. And then there are some things that are kind of just for um wealthy people. I mean, at the I've been to their main conference, which is like a four day conference twice. And there were most, you know, the young people there are mostly wealthy, except they might have non wealthy partners, but lots of the staff and then lots of people who are coming from movements to talk about stuff are not wealthy. So it's not like this enclave of just entirely rich people. But I really want to and I want to say and I, I should have emphasized this a little bit more. I think that the the work that these that these class that happens in these class homogenous spaces where people are able to talk about stuff that sometimes they've never talked about before. I mean, it's kind of like when you imagine white people talking about white supremacy, you know, that the stuff that just like people of color don't need to hear that just like people, you know, without wealth don't need to hear like all your struggles about being rich. Um, but it can be very, very useful. And it's not just like rich people crying about their money. Um, it's actually politically transformative. Mm -hmm. Nick Ziegler, our colleague in political science, um, asks the following question. Do your interviewees also feel pressure from other wealthy individuals to conform to quote unquote, conventional ideas preserving wealth? Interesting or interesting to him because the class traders you describe cut against the political science theory. These folks cut against the theory of Jeffrey Winter uh, who argues that today's oligarchy of wealth spontaneously and tenaciously defends its property rights against any and all challenges, including particularly your, uh, your wealthy rebels. So how, what kind of pressure, in short, are your interviewees feeling from the, from the oligarchy? <laughs> well, I think it depends on what you mean by the oligarchy and oh, where no, you I'm might... just adding that yeah. to his yeah. question. I, I'm sorry to make it a little silly. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, that's kind of what I'm talking about is the norms. I think there's a, you know, implicit theory of like, that's not like made explicit in the question of that there's an oligarchy of wealth. Like what form does that defense take, right? And of course it, you know, that lots of these people are electorally super active and, you know, trying to push for laws that maintain their own capacity to accumulate and so on. So some of the class traders have those people in their own families. Right. And it's very difficult for them to to engage those. I, I think that the. You know, for the most part, the people that I'm talking about move in relatively liberal circles, 
some people, especially the older class traders, like people who grew up in the 50s and 60s, sometimes came from very, very conservative families, like old money families. And, you know, they would have to kind of engage their family members about this. But it, I don't, I don't know where they like come into contact really with the with some kind of an oligarchy that, that so it's sort of like what's the mechanism of that pushing back like sure these are people who are pushing back against those oligarchs and what they're trying to do but it's not like they're live next door to the oligarch and have to talk to the oligarch for the most part uh steve mcalear asks why did you decide to start in the 1970s and were you tempted to go back and look at this in historical context like say 19th century. I mean, I mean, that's I think a different project. I, I think it's certainly an interesting project, and people have written historically about you know fig, historical figures who have taken radical action. I'm I don't know. I you know there may have been a, a sort of organizational field of wealthy people doing radical things at some point, rather than just radical individuals. Um, I don't have a sense of that. I mean, of course, there's a there's a history. Like, for example, Julius Rosenwald, who was famously progressive. I mean, progressive-ish for the time, um, philanthropist, you know, Jewish. I think immigrant who made a fortune working for Sears Roebuck. You know, around 1910, gave a lot of money to schools to these. They're called Rosenwald schools, black schools in the South. Um, his daughter was Edith Stern and she had a foundation that was quite progressive for its time. And Edith Stern's uh, granddaughter was, is named Anne Hess. And she was one of the founders of one of these social justice philanthropy things, the North Star Fund that I talked about um, and active in founding other of these organizations in the seventies. So there is, you know, there's like a literal lineage of that. And um, there was, yeah, whatever. I mean, I don't need to go into too much detail about it, but so, I don't know that there's, I'm interested in, the, in an organizational field and what happens in these organizations and kind of how these ideas travel over time. And I really do think that the contemporary version of them comes out of the movements of the 60s. So it's just not part of my project to go back further than that. But I, you know, I certainly welcome anybody else to do it. Yes, it's a new Gilded Age. I mean, we're living in a Gilded Age that really began in the 1970s. So it makes that makes a lot of sense. Could you give us a little context for um, the class traders? Should we view them as a kind of oddity on the edge of wealth? Should we view them as, I mean, you've done two books now, one looking at sort of wealth and the other and how people think about it and, and, and then this, the class traders. How would you think about them as, um, as a significant part of wealthy people? Are they, as I say, a curiosity? Or is this something that we really need to take as significant uh, in terms of the politics of this Gilded Age? Yeah, well, I hope we need to take it as significant or all this work I've done on it is maybe for naught. But so of course I'm invested in thinking that it matters. Yeah, um, yeah I don't know. I think that, um, this is why I keep saying, I think that the narrative moment of it is the part that matters the most because the, um, yeah, you know, how much is a lot of money, right? There's no, it, again, it's all relative, right? So all of these people are moving, you know, maybe they'll move a billion dollars, let's say, is that a lot? You know, sure, that's a lot, but is it kind of not that much relative to the amount of money that billionaires can move in conservative ways? Also true, right? So I'm a little bit, and this is partly why I'm less concerned with sort of outcomes in terms of like the money that gets moved, because to me, what they actually are doing is intervening in these narratives about deservedness, you know, who deserves it and why. And I think it's very powerful but for people who have these resources to say, I don't deserve these, not because, you know, I inherited it and I didn't work for it, but because, you know, maybe I did work for it or maybe my father worked for it and he still doesn't deserve it either because this is insane, you know, that different kinds of work are remunerated in different ways and whatever, you know, the white privilege and all these other kinds of privilege have allow for this accumulation. And um, so I think, and I also think it's, it's not just the critique of 
these deservedness narratives. It's also a vision where people don't have to just, as one of my informants said, like hide behind their piles of money in order to be secure, right? That you can, if we can imagine ways to be a good rich person that involves more community and more solidarity with people who aren't rich, as opposed to this kind of defensive stance that's motivated, I think, not by greed or not only by greed or not necessarily by greed, but by all of these other things. Um, I think if we can unpack that, it will, it, it opens the way, you know, as many movements do and many narratives do, uh, to thinking about like the common good in a way that we kind of don't think about it in the US anymore. So that's where I think it, it's, it really matters. Yeah, these are a very small number of people. It's, you know, a rel for that reason, a relatively small amount of money. Um, but these, you know, I think it's really fascinating that every week there's like an article in some major publication about these people giving all their money. And sometimes it's like, oh, rich kids and aren't they cute? You know, they don't think they deserve the money. But I think that, and there's also these movements in philanthropy that I didn't even really mention, but that are really critical of conventional philanthropy. And that I think are moving out of, you know, weird radical spaces into more mainstream spaces. And I think that that makes a difference too. Yeah, really opening up political space. Rich Snyder uh, says, excellent talk, a colleague in political science also. Excellent talk and important research, thank you. Question, do you have a sense of how much social interaction the rich, however you define it, have with unwealthy people? Do their friendship circles span the wealth, no wealth divide? Do the wealthy rebels differ from the non-rebels in terms of the nature and scope of their social network? Thanks again. Yeah, I think that's a super important question. And the answer is yes, they do have more cross-class and cross-race contact. And um, I, you know, you can ask like, is that the independent or the dependent variable, right? Like, is it the cause or the outcome of this kind of work? I kind of think it's both. I mean, and you actually see that more in, in Uneasy Street, that the people that, you know, Jim mentioned that I categorize people into upward facing and downward facing. And that the downward facing people understand themselves as wealthy, not based on having more money than people who are looking upward, but partly because they have much more diverse social networks. Partly they have more diverse social networks because they tend to work in jobs like in nonprofits or academia or the arts or whatever, where there's like more non-wealthy people. Um, and you know, which comes first, there's a kind of chicken and egg thing with that too. They have more progressive politics, therefore they, whatever. But so that I think, I actually think that's kind of the number one thing that keeps rich people from just leaving the earth in terms of how they understand themselves. And so for class traders, you know, many of them have had relationships with, because they are working in social movements, you know, they have relationships, meaningful relationships with people who are very different from, from them and very um, different, you know, in, in all kinds of ways. Um, but they also come to those relationships, you know, and I think some older people in these spaces come to those relationships through these organizations also. And so they, you know, might learn about like racial justice and then in their like reading group with other rich white people, and then they start getting involved in more class trader organizations. And then they start, you know, actually having, becoming, having relationships of whatever kind um, with people of color or people who, who have less. So, yeah. And I think that if we had more of those relationships organically in our lives, which, you know, so many of us don't have, um, I, I actually think we would face a kind of different political climate. Yes, I know. I really appreciate that question. Yeah, he would very much agree. Uh, if we were sitting around a seminar room, he'd be nodding his head uh, with that. Margaret asks uh, a, another good question and a good one. Uh, how did their different uh, view of merit enter the mainstream? And do they have a specific ideas, your um, uh, class traders, do they have specific ideas about how to disseminate uh, the ideas of merit more broadly? Yeah, I think that differs in these different kinds of spaces. I mean, actually, I think that Patriotic Millionaires is an organization that sees itself more as both. I mean, it, I think it is kind of a lobbying organization, even though it doesn't have that much power. But they have a much more conventional kind of like, meet, come meet with this progressive, you know, congressperson or whatever. 
But yeah, I think they have more of a media strategy. I mean, as I said, you know, I remember when the Trump tax cuts in 2017 were being proposed or were about to be voted on, they had this campaign of like their members being like, I'm a millionaire and this is ridiculous. And here's why I shouldn't actually, you know, get this tax cut. Um, and that I think, I don't know that the other, that other organizations in the field have such a kind of directed media strategy or kind of dissemination strategy, partly because they tend to be more focused on kind of working in tandem with or following the leadership of more marginalized groups, which are not, you know, so I think there's, it's, it certainly like resource generation has a whole book called classified, which is, you know, might be of interest to people. And then if I had a PowerPoint, the one image I would show is a, uh, the resource generation class privilege x-ray, which is an image of like a person who's like, you know, has a good smile and is well-spoken and, you know, whatever, seems like a good job candidate. And then it's like, a, you know, there's like an x-ray where it says like, had a good dentist because they had money and went to an elite school, and you know, like shows all the classified, it's very sociological <laughs> um, or social scientific, perhaps I should say to this audience. But um, so in that sense, like, yeah, they are pushing against narratives, but they're not doing it in some like mainstream media, social media kind of way. Are the organizations and the people you interviewed overwhelmingly members of blue America? And do they uh, and do they sort of push into red America in terms of the kinds of funding they do? You mentioned several times uh, black farmers in the South. Is that one example uh, of, um, of many of blue America trying to con you know, uh, affect red America or how, how would you map this onto blue and red America? Yeah, I think it's mostly blue America. I mean, it's a lot of it is coastal, but, you know, I've interviewed people who live not just like, you know, New York, Boston, Chicago, you know, the Bay Area, Los Angeles, but also a lot of people in the South. I mean, New Orleans, um, North Carolina. So um, there's people in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not, you know, those are like blue islands in yeah. sometimes red, red or purple states. Um, <laughs> the, I mean, I said black farmers in the South because my informant said that as like an example of a thing that his financial advisor did not want him to invest in. But uh, again, like even if they grew up, some of these people, and some of them grew up in the Midwest also, you know, and not in big cities necessarily, like in Ohio and places like that. So I don't, I think this is a pretty coherent kind of outlook. I mean, many of these people are trying to do very local work and a lot of it is focused in the South as a kind of underfunded region. But it's not mostly, I don't think that these people are working with, you know, red state like conservatives, right? I mean, this is this is more like liberals getting pushed to the left. Mm. Um, and like the patriotic millionaires, I mean, some and you know, that many of them have spoken publicly about this about their work with the patriotic millionaires but you know we'll say like none of my friends i can't talk to any of my friends about this my other millionaire you know old man millionaire friends like they don't they don't want to hear it and and so that's and that's not a really like an organizing project so that's sort of just like eh, whatever like i'll play golf with them but we're not going to talk about politics mm. so uh, this is an anonymous you talked about this a little but uh someone will ask to have um have you reflect a little bit more on the inheritors of wealth as opposed to the attitudes of the people who made it themselves? And you talked a little bit, a couple of your examples were people who were caught in the coils of intergenerational wealth, so to speak. I, and I, I wonder if you could expand on that, on that difference. Yeah, absolutely. I, I do think that the inheritors of wealth tend to be more, um, conflicted personally, partly because they don't, they can't use the regular narratives of merit, right? They didn't earn it. So they can't say that they did earn it. So they tend to be a little more in the kind of, you know, vortex of, of guilt and shame at some point. And I, and I think that that lasts for many people, like, you know, through their entire adulthood. I don't think it's only a, like a young person thing. Um, you know, I talked to one, this 
guy who was active in resource generation, but who didn't come from wealth at all. His parents were immigrants from um, China and they had accumulated a, couple of, a few million dollars with a small business, but he didn't come from inherited wealth at all. And he talked about the way that, I mean, partly he was um, Chinese American, so he you know, was not white, but he talked about the way white inheritors just wanted to wash it off you know, they just wanted to like get rid of this like stench, you know, stigma of having wealth. And he was like, I don't feel like that at all. I feel like excited to control it and to give it away and to do stuff with it. You know, so I think that that's a, a bit of a difference. Um, I also think it depends on which accumulators you're talking about, right? So people who accumulated wealth, like I said, with the, the patriotic millionaire, some of those people, you know, grew up poor or at least middle class and went to, you know, free the University of California or something like that, you know, in the 60s, and then happened to end up in the tech sector and happened to, you know, make up $20 million or $50 million because of something like hitting in tech. And, you know, they didn't expect that they didn't or people who went into tech, you know, not expecting to make a lot of money and did. And those people, I think also, you know, they see just the the random nature of that kind of win. I mean, it's both structured, you know, because of their advantages, but it's also like could have not happened. Somebody just as deserving as them, you know, might not have happened to that person. So those kinds of accumulators, they they see the process through which they have accumulated, um, even if they don't feel so bad about it. And then I think that accumulators come into the picture when they are the parents of people who are going to be inheritors in the ways that I said that accumulators are. Um, often feel like they're being accused of something, you know, I spent my whole life trying to make this money for you and be successful. And now mm -hmm. you're telling me you don't want it. And then I'm a bad person because I work in finance, you know, or something like that. So that inheritors don't feel, you know, a lot of these inheritors who have parents who are also inheritors, the parents themselves are kind of conflicted about it. And sometimes the parents and the, and the adult children you know, sort of like working together to redistribute. So it's complicated. Um, is is the shorter version that answers? Sorry, I hope that was coherent in some way. No, yeah, uh, yeah. Well, one thing we get from working, reading your work is that money is complicated. Uh -huh. uh, but political scientists and economists already know that, uh, I suppose. You know, we haven't talked at all about gender, mm -hmm. and I wonder. You, you, uh, you, you suggested that you've had both uh, men and women uh, uh, in interviews, and you see any systematic differences in the, uh, their attitudes as you interview them? Yeah, I, there are. And I would say in general, there are more women in this space. And I think among the, the kind of founders of these early organizations, you know, one of them is famously George Pillsbury of the Pillsbury um, Doughboy, like literal Doughboy. Oh, yeah. um, you know, he was one of the founders of Haymarket in Boston, and there were, and his sister was one of the founders of Liberty Hill, which is a similar organization in Los Angeles. And um, but a lot of those people were men. Maybe it was evenly divided, but like kind of straight white men was common in those circles then. And and I think in the '90s, you know, Resource Generation was founded by white lesbians, um, and the whole thing has a very there are a lot of queer people active in Resource Generation and in these spaces generally, um, and a lot of people who identify as women or some of them identify as non-binary or as trans, but more non-binary, I think. Um, but not as cis men. And that's another thing that changed actually is that when I started in 2018, there were like no cis men at the Resource Generation Conference and the following year, there were a lot more. And now I've seen more in these kinds of spaces. But I do think it's kind of, you know, and even in among older people who are, it is women, partly it is my contention, although I, don't, I can't prove this exactly, that women are less wedded to ideas of success that have to do with money because culturally they're given more options right and so they don't it, it's not quite as like strike to the heart like i'm only a good successful person if i've accumulated money somehow mm -hmm. um so that and women have you know often been in charge of the philanthropy in their families the kind of community orientation right like often not the the actual investment of money but um so yeah, I think that there's more, 
I, so I think women kind of dominate in this field. Man, man, dominate is a strong word, but there's more of them mm. um, for those reasons and historical reasons. And I think that men, I, I think women, some, you know, I'm just thinking about my sample. I think women can be more conflicted about it, especially not in the kind of younger resource generation spaces, but in the, um, among old people over, you know, 40 or 45, that there's, that women feel weird. Like I've interviewed couples where like the man is kind of like, yeah, like I think we should give it away and it's bad, but I don't feel bad about it. And the woman is more conflicted. And again, I think men typically have more access to the, like I earned it or I invested it and it made more money or I, you know, that they're just, they're, they're more tied into that. And so they can't step away from it as easily. Yeah, and I should say, as long as I'm on the subject, I'll just say yeah. something about race yeah, yeah. too. I mean, you know, I haven't talked a lot about this, but as I said, initially there's, there are a number of people in my sample, probably 15% of the wealthy people who are not white, even though none of them are black and none of them are Latino. Is that true? Yeah. Um, you know, there are very few African-American or Latino people in these spaces for obvious reasons. They don't tend to have generational wealth. Um, that might not be the only reason, but but a lot of the people of color, you know, they are typically South and East Asian, and they talk about not wanting to be used as sort of like props in the meritocracy myth. So they don't want anybody to say like so-and-so's family made it, you know, immigrated from China or Taiwan or, you know, wherever. Um, they made it. So therefore, there is a level playing field, right? They still want to be critical of that. They don't necessarily have guilt in the same way, again, as you might expect, but they're also not like, yes, this is great. You know, we deserve everything we can get. So I think that's a, like an interesting way to think to think about. Mm, fascinating. Uh, we're just about out of time, but I wanted to ask you to share a little bit. And I know this is a curveball because it goes all the way back to uh, your very early work. But um, I, many of our uh, people who are listening will not have read class acts. And I wish you'd talk just a little bit about if you can remember that far back in your research, uh, what it was like to uh, talk to and, and understand workers as they faced these kinds of wealthy people in, in the hotels. I think you were very moving in that book about the kind of dignity that they felt uh, even uh, in the face of great inequality. And maybe as a last question, you could just uh, share a little bit of that with uh, with the audience, if you can think back to your very first book. Yeah, my very first book. I do. I do remember it well. <laughs> when I pick it up, it's like every st sentence is still very familiar to me. Oh. I think perhaps a dissertation book, especially, I've already read it, you know, ten million times. Yeah. No, I think we all we've all been there. We all remember that. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, it's interesting. I don't. I don't think of it as being about like the language of dignity. I think of it more as being about ways that they find to not feel subordinated. Um, and so, you know, the argument basically of the book is that in the face of having to provide luxury service, which is, you know, requires a lot of self-subordination um, and anticipation of needs and not, not sort of like bowing and scraping self-subordination, yeah. but certainly a recognition of like you, my interlocutor, the guest are entitled to all of my labor. Um, you know, they find ways to interpret themselves as better than the guests or better than other people who work in their hotel, better than people who work in other hotels, you know, so there's one whole sort of set of arguments about the way that they draw symbolic boundaries and find ways for themselves to be superior. Um, and then there's a bunch of things that they do to, um, I make these arguments about the ways that they play games, particularly tipped workers around tips and, you know, the ways that then you can kind of turn your own self-subordination into a game. And then the ways that they have a kind of implicit contract with the guests of sort of reciprocity, you know, the golden rule um, in which guests treat workers really well. You know, I was really surprised, honestly, when I started working in these hotels by how well workers were treated, you know, guests, some guests will bring them gifts and, you know, tip them really a lot and really care about them and especially repeat guests. 
and even most of the other guests were like quite polite and, you know, they, they kind of want to deserve the service, right? They don't want to be entitled either. Of course, not everybody's like that. There's some people who are horrible and rude and obnoxious, but those people are kind of the outliers. So there's a way in which by constant, I'm arguing in the book, by constituting these kind of contracts of reciprocity where everybody's nice to everybody else, um, workers normalize guests entitlement to their labor and the whole class you know apparatus that's like structuring the whole relationship sort of fades into the background and and that's you know what norms of reciprocity do i'm really arguing that in a sense an uneasy street also like yeah you should be nice to the waiter but the fact that you're nice to the waiter doesn't mean it's like okay for you to have 10 million dollars and the waiter to have nothing even though i think what i argued in class acts is that the waiter might think that it's okay you know Great. Well, Professor Sherman, thank you. This has been a great pleasure. And you can see from the questions, people are totally engaged. Do let us know, when, do let the project know when the when uh, Class Traders comes out, because we'll all be eager to follow up this conversation with uh, with reading the book. But thanks I, for so. I appreciate your interest. Uh, thanks so much. Yeah. And uh, welcome back to Brown, I should have said. Yeah. And uh, we'll, 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 we'll be in touch and look forward to carrying on the conversation in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Bye-bye. Bye. And thanks, everybody, for coming. Next Monday, uh, please come for Pepper Cole Pepper, who will be at the Kim Koo Library. So if you're interested in comparative analysis of uh, uh, how people see wealth in the United States differently from uh, other countries, uh, come, come see Professor Culpepper. And again, thanks to Professor Sherman for a really lively hour and a half.